Hello and praise the Lord to everyone. Truly, it's good to be here on this morning, the first bright Sunday in the month of February. We're so glad and thankful uh, to be here on today. Thankful for each and every one of you who have uh, decided to join us on this morning. As always, uh, we invite you to check us out. Uh, the Dominion Tabernacle Take It By Force Ministries on our website, takeitbyforce.net. On that website, you can find a lot of great information, a lot of great information about who we are, what we do, what our mission is, what our activity in the marketplace looks like. A lot of good information on there. You'll also find our YouTube link on there as well. So we invite you to like our Facebook page, um, follow us, Twitter, Twitter, Instagram, subscribe to our uh, YouTube channel. And also, uh, please feel free to, to donate to the ministry. There's a donation link down at the bottom as well. I excited on last Thursday night was the first session of our uh, time initiative, Taken by Force Marketplace Entrepreneurship. Extremely excited about that initiative and want to encourage you to please sign up. It's not too late for you to sign up and check us out. It's going to be each Thursday, each Thursday from uh, 7.30 until 8.30. All you have to do is go uh, to the top of the link on our website and you can click on that link. It will take you directly to our event right uh, sign up and on there included in that link will be the handouts uh, that are included in the in the session. It's a great opportunity to talk about practical leadership. I share with you from my experiences in corporate and non-profit management, some basic nuggets, basic tips and strategies around leadership, what does it mean to lead. And we also look at uh, talking about soft skills, soft skills which are extremely important in the marketplace in this day and time because you have a lot of employees who have hard skills, but they lack um, soft skills in order to be successful. And so we talk about those soft skills. And then we also look at the concept of being an entrepreneur from a Christ perspective, uh, utilizing Christ as the model when it comes to being a successful entrepreneur. So please, please uh, check us out on Thursday nights. Uh, go ahead and register. And it's for all ages, well, high school, middle school, uh, adults as well. So it's very practical, very, very practical, and it can be applied to both youth and uh, young adults and adults as as well. So please, please uh, join us for, for that. All right, what I want to do on this morning is to uh, speak with you for a few minutes on today. Uh, 2 Corinthians chapter 6, 2 Corinthians chapter number 6. Now, if this is your first time joining in with us, then I would definitely encourage you to go back and visit uh, the previous messages uh, that we've been talking about in this particular uh, series here, uh, what we've been looking at and trying to understand the importance of our actions the importance of our actions and making sure that our actions are in agreement, that our actions are in agreement with uh, God's purpose for our life. And we want to make sure that when, we, when we're on stage, when we take the stage out in the marketplace, who is first, who takes first and center? Who takes first and center? And so then making sure that Christ uh, is, the, is the individual who takes center stage uh, when we are out in the marketplace trying to uh, help impact and trying to help serve the needs of others. So 2 Corinthians chapter 6, and I want to look at verse number, uh, verse number 14, verse number 14. And it reads there, and I'll be coming from the uh, King James Version, and it says there, Be ye not unequally yoked together with unbelievers. For what fellowship have righteousness with unrighteousness? And what communion have light with darkness? 
And what concord hath Christ with Belial? Or what part hath he that believeth with an infidel? And what agreement hath the temple of God with idols? For ye are the temple of the living God. As God has said, I will dwell in them and walk in them. and I will be their God and they shall be my people. Wherefore, come out from among them and be ye separate, saith the Lord. And touch not the unclean thing and I will receive you and will be a father unto you. Ye shall be my sons and daughters, saith the Lord Almighty. So we want to use as a uh, subject on this morning, the right frame. The right frame. Now, I think that as we've been looking at these lessons here over the, over the past few weeks, we've been building upon uh, going back to the initial uh, title on January the 12th, it's performance time. It's performance time. And, and then building upon that on January the 19th, we came back with lights, camera, action. And we've been uh, dealing with this idea again around when you're on stage, uh, who takes center? Who takes center? And then we followed it up on our last week uh, by talking about action dealing with the word action and making sure that it's not only lights, camera, action, but making sure that our actions are in agreement, that our actions are in agreement with who's behind the camera. And of course we know that God, he is the ultimate director, producer. Well, he's the ultimate writer, producer, and director. And his eyes are always upon us, looking and observing our actions. And so then we're wanting to make sure that in this hour we have to be on the same page. Our life has to be on the same page. Our life has to be on the same script with the writer, producer, and director. And even on last week, we talked about it even more. We said the writer being God the Father, the producer being uh, the son, because his role is to produce that which the writer has written. And then the Holy Spirit being the director, the director who helps give direction. Mm -hmm. And so then wanting to make sure that what we do in life that we're all on the step, that we are on the same page with, with the Lord. And so we talked about last week, what is action? Well, we define action simply as being movement. That's all action is, it's movement. And then we broke it down even further, is that well, there are two types of movement. You have mental movement. Mm -hmm. All right, and then you have physical movement. Well, mental movement is simply where those thoughts, those intentions begin to take shape in your heart and in your mind. And, and, and we looked at how God uh, had a plan. He had a plan. He had an agreement. And, that's what, and, and, and being in agreement, being on the same page with God, you have to make sure that you know well, what, is, what is God looking for? What is his expectation? And so we looked at Jeremiah 31. Uh, 31, 33, where God spells out through the prophet Jeremiah, but this shall be the covenant. And another word for covenant is simply agreement. So if you want to know what God's e expectation is, well, Jeremiah 31, 33, this shall be the covenant, the agreement that I will make with the house of Israel. After those days, they said the Lord, I will put my law, I will put my word got to see that right there. I will put my law. I will put my word. Now, what is the significance of God's word? 
You need to ask yourself that question. What is the significance of God's word? That he would be willing to share his word with us. Us being his creation. What is it about God's word? Now I'm going to come back to Jeremiah 31, 33 in a minute. But let's go over to Hebrews for a minute. What is it about God's word? It's a powerful tool, isn't it? Mm -hmm. It's a powerful tool. Hebrews 11.3. Look there for me for just a minute. Hebrews 11.3 right there. It says, through faith, we understand. We come to a consensus. We conclude. We don't waver. We don't question. We don't flow from one doctrine to the other, but we stand steadfast. We understand that the what? That the world, the universe, all of creation, the worlds were what? In my Bible, and I like how King James writes it out sometimes. Sometimes you just cannot beat the, the King James translation. I know we have a lot of other translations that help us come into a, a, a better understanding, but sometimes the way the King James is written, and sometimes, it, and sometimes it's written where there's a consensus regardless of what translation you read, the words are the same. But right here, right here, it says in verse 3, the worlds were framed. I like that word, framed. Circle it, highlight it, do something to it. Frame. When you frame something, it means to give structure. It means to give order. Teaching already. When you talk about filming, because we've been talking about lights, camera, action, what is a frame? What is a frame? A frame is simply a single image. A single, single means what? You're by yourself. <laughs> uh, Genesis 1 and 1 says, in the beginning, says what? God. <laughs> Which lets me know he didn't have no help. <laughs> oh, I know sometimes we want to we try and, 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 and come up with a, with a lot of different religions and a lot of different doctrines and a lot of different philosophies, man-made doctrines as to how we think the world and the universe came into existence. But, but, but Hebrews 11 and 3 is clear. The worlds were framed. A frame being a single imprint, a single image. In the beginning, God created. And when you talk about a frame as it relates to filming, Yes, a frame is a single image, but watch this though, you got to get this right here. A frame is also the entrance. Somebody say entrance. entrance. Somebody say, get ready to open the door, open the door, open, open the, the door, door, open the door. Open the door of your heart, open the door of your mind. Why? Because Jeremiah 31. And 33 is coming. Huh? Say the say the frame is coming. The frame is coming. From it, from when you talk about filmmaking, a frame is simply the entrance of a person into the into a shop. All that simply means it's the emerge, it's the entrance of someone stepping on stage. Yes. That's all a frame is. Hmm? And so we know from Genesis 1 and 1, in the beginning, God did what? He created. He is the ultimate frame. He is the ultimate frame. He is the, he is the ultimate God that when he entered onto the scene, he brought light. He brought light. Yeah, he did. Yeah, he 
Yeah, he did. Yeah, he did. Yeah, he did. It says that the earth, Genesis 1 2, was dark and without form and was what? Void and oh. darkness was what? Everywhere. And the Spirit of God, the frame of God, the entrance of the presence of God, did what? He moved upon the face of the water. And then not only did he enter in, but then he what? He had some action to come on. It says, and God spoke. He spoke. And God's word, when he speaks it, it has the capacity to change the dynamics of a circumstance or situation. Somebody say frame, frame, frame. What is a frame again? A frame, it's a single image. It is the entrance of a person into a steel shop. That when that, that that when that person enters into that shop, changes the dynamics of what's going on or what's happening. So you gotta have the right frame. Somebody say the right frame, the right frame, the right frame. You gotta have the right frame in your life. That's the title of today's lesson. The right frame. You gotta have the right frame. You know the song said, My my hope is built on nothing less than Jesus' blood. And righteousness, I dare not trust the what? Sweetest frame. frame. Oh, huh? Y'all know it. Come on, come on. And see, that's, that's, and see, we need to learn how to sing those songs. We need to learn how to teach this generation of young people about him. Every house needs to have a, a hymn book. Because those songs have meaning in them. I dare not trust, which means there are some other things out there that I can't put my trust in. Amen. What is trust? Trust is simply what? Faith. <laughs> I dare not trust the sweetest. Not just the sweetest. That means there are some things out there that look very attractive. The sweetest. I don't care how enticing it looks, how sweet it may be, but the song says, I dare not, I dare not cross that line. I dare not trust the sweetest praise. Yes, I don't care how good it may look, how enticing it may I dare not trust the sweetest frame, but holy lean on Christ the solid Rock I stand. All other ground is sinking sand. So you got to have the right frame. Somebody say the right frame. The right, the right frame. frame. The right frame. The right frame. Still in Hebrews. Still in Hebrews. Still in Hebrews. Hebrews 11.3. So by faith, I understand that the worlds were framed by the word of God. The word of God has the capacity, as I said a few moments ago, to come in and shake things up. Amen. He can topple buildings in seconds. That which takes men years and months to to establish, God can come along and just shape it. Oh, Lord Jesus. By His Word! If God's Word can frame the universe, how much do you. Come on, man. God's Word can either break or make it. Come on, man. To understand that's how powerful his word is. He said that the world was framed by the word of God. That's why it's important for you to know the word of God for your life. Know how to read and interpret God's word. So, so, you know, so it's important for you to understand then. God's word is a frame. God's word is a frame. Mm -hmm. 
Now, 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 understand that. And by that frame, he created the heavens and the earth. Now, keeping that in mind, I want us to go to 2 Corinthians. Because when you look at 2 Corinthians, uh, more specifically here, uh, uh, chapter number 6, Paul here, looking down at verse number 14, he offers the reader here some, some advice, especially to the people at Corinth, because he doesn't want them to be without knowledge. He don't know any better. He's trying to help them. He knows that they're living in an environment where you've got craziness all around you. Yep, absolutely. But he's trying to give them some practical good advice that can help them along the way. Now, now, now look down at verse number 14. He, he said, Be not unequally young. Now let's talk about that word for a minute. Be not unequally yoked. Let's talk about the word yoke. The word yoke. What is a yoke? Now, in order to get a good handle on what you know what the word yoke is. It's good if you look at it from an agricultural standpoint first. Agricultural deals with what? Farming. Because when you think about the livelihood or the, the, the trade of people during this time, it was what? Agriculture. When Jesus taught, he oftentimes taught in what? Parables that dealt with what? Agriculture, planting, sowing. So when you approach this from an agricultural standpoint and you define what a yoke is, a yoke. Is a wooden frame. Oh, there's that word. A yoke is a wooden frame. Which joins two animals. It's a wooden frame <clears throat> that joins two animals. Now, oftentimes, again, talking about agriculture, oftentimes the animals that were included were called oxen. Oxen. And so what you would do is you would take this wooden frame and you would put it around two parts of the ox. Now, 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 watch again. This is key that you get this here, where the yoke was, was put on. It wasn't put on the feet. It wasn't put on the tail. But this wooden frame was put around, it was put over the head and around the neck. Mm -hmm. 
where I'm going to be with this today, but I'm going to try my best. The key here is to look at two words. The yoke, the wooden frame was put over the head and around the neck of the oxen. What are the two key parts of the oxen? The head and the what? Neck. Mm -hmm. Why is that important? Because if you have two oxen, and see, oxen were used to plow the field. They were used to plow the field. And so if you have two oxen working on one job, then it's important for both of those oxen to be on the what? Same page, going in the what? Same direction. Huh? Two oxen, one plow, one farmer, one field, need to make sure that you're going in the what? Same direction. And so when you when so when the yoke is put around the head and the neck, there is a joining together of the head and the neck. The head represents what? The mindset. The neck implies direction. Because you turn with your what? Your neck. Your head and your neck represent the direction that you're what? That you're going into. So when the yoke is put upon, when this wooden frame is put upon the head and the neck of the oxen, there is a joining together. There is a joining together. There is a working together. That's the purpose of the yoke. It's a wooden frame that joins two animals, two oxen. Where does it join them at? At the head and the neck. Why? So that they can do what? Work together. Now, now, oftentimes, well, before I say that, you got to make sure you have the what? The right frame. Mm -hmm. huh? Because if you don't have the right frame, then it's going to be hard to do what? Work together. Work together. Mm -hmm. This is just agriculture. I haven't gotten to people yet. I'm just talking about agriculture, right? I'm just talking agriculture, agriculturally. When you're dealing with two animals, there has to be a yoke, there has to be a certain frame that goes about them in order for them to achieve their goal. Now, stick with me because I'm still talking agriculture. The challenge here, the challenge comes along. Now, keep a bookmark in 2 Corinthians 6 because Paul says, be not unequally what? Yo, I had forgotten where I am. I had forgotten where I am. Because see, Paul, he's talking about people right there in verse number 14, but I want to talk about, about these animals for just a second. Now, keep a bookmark right there in 2 Corinthians Six. Now, go back to Deuteronomy 22. Deuteronomy 22. Okay. 
Deuteronomy 22 now. Now this is now look at Deuteronomy 22, and we're gonna to go to verse number 10. Verse number 10. Now these now verse number 10 here. These were just simply some some law, some strategies that the Lord gave the children of Israel through Moses. And down there in Deuteronomy 22 and 10, he says down there what? Thou shall not do what? Plow with an ox and an ass. Now in some translations it may say ass. In some translations it may say a donkey. Okay? Now, now don't take him and make it perverse. No. But that's what they that's what that's what the animals were called. All right, but he said, "Do not plow with those two animals together." Now, why is that? Why is that? Why is that? Well, God knew that because He's the Creator of all things, isn't He? Amen. So God knew. The build, the nature, <laughs> and the temperament of those two animals. In other words, he knew the character and the nature of those two animals. And what is that? Why would he say that? Why would he say that? Well, let's talk about it for a minute. Because when you talk about the ox, the ox, see, Sometimes, you know, before you enter in, in, into relationships with people, it's good to, 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 to know a little bit about their nature, mm -hmm. their temperament, mm -hmm. and their character before you say, I do. Now, now, when I say you say, I do, I'm not talking about getting into a marital relationship. No, no, no. I'm talking about when you enter into some type of relationship, whether it's work relationship, collaborative relationship, some type of, of agreement. There we go, right there. Some type of, of an agreement. You need to know who, you, who you're dealing with. There's a reason why God said, don't let the ox and the donkey plow together. The plowing represents the assignment. That, that's the job. See, 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 that's the job. See, sometimes, folks, you... you you, you go into a job, you go into an assignment, you go into to these collaborative efforts. Well, you're not on the same page. The ox and the donkey are on two separate pages. As it relates to their character and their temperament. Let's talk, let's talk about, let's talk. Now, let me, listen, when you talk about the ox, let's talk about the ox for a minute. Now, the ox was, was, well, again, oftentimes used for pulling a plow, okay? Now, what are some of the characteristics of the ox? Well, the ox was oftentimes slow. Slower. And oftentimes it said that with the ox, you know, in its slow pace, its, its precision is good. Its accuracy is on point. Not only was an ox that, 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 that is slower, it's more durable. The durability of an ox is very durable. Now, 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 as with a donkey, a donkey tends to move a little faster. 
Which now, if you got one that's moving slow, and then you got one that's what? Trying to hurry up the process and move fast, then the operator of the plow is going to get what? A little frustrated because you got one that, that, that need help one. Some of you are in collaborative efforts. Because you got an ox on one side and a donkey on the other. What else about the ox? What else about the ox? The ox like routine. You give an ox, you put an ox on the plow and plow and plow. For years, the ox has no problem with it. It likes routine. The ox tends to be calm. Mm. But yet in its calmness and in its routine and in its slowness, it's steadily producing results. <laughs> Plowing the field. Now, 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 you know, the ox is, is traditionally known to be a plow. Now, with the donkey now, you know, the donkeys look faster, yeah, yeah. But now, but now, but now, the donkey is seen as one who can be used to plow, yeah. But see, the donkey is not as strong as the ox. But now, the donkey now is oftentimes seen as, as the one that transports people. It was more common for a, a person to get on a donkey and be transported from one. Oh yeah, well you know that's so. Called Jesus came riding into Jerusalem. Yeah, 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 yeah. See, see, donkeys were used to transport precious gems. So you wouldn't go take your valuables and put them on an ox. No, 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 no. Donkeys were entrusted to transport those things that were that were valuable, that were precious. See, with the donkey, you know, the donkey is so kind of just laid back. The donkey, he, he, just, he just comes on in, just glides on in, you see. But the oxen, the oxen, it comes pulling. It, it comes bring with, the, with, 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 with this weight. Uh, the neck and the shoulder of the oxen is stronger than that of the donkey. But nonetheless, though, the donkey is entrusted with the what? The precious gems. Transfer. It's not all about sometimes the most biggest and the strongest to be entrusted with the most precious. Mm. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's a reason why Jesus said, go get the coat or the donkey that is tied and bring him to me. He didn't go looking for an oxen. An ox. But he went looking for a what? Donkey. Now I didn't discredit one or the other. All Deuteronomy said that you don't need both. You don't need one and the other trying to pull the same flat. That doesn't take away the importance of one or the other. That just means you gotta know how to mix. See, you, see, you, we need to learn. See, in networking, it's about knowing the right mix, y'all. In networking, it's about knowing the right, the right mix. And you're not being judgmental, but in this hour, you need to realize and recognize who needs to stay and who needs to go. It's nothing personal. It's nothing. You're not thinking that you're better than me, or I'm better than you, or your ministry is bigger than my ministry. Because the truth of the matter is. We don't own anything. But understanding the value and the, the ox, the ox, the ox, the ox. Here's another thing about the donkey that I thought, I thought was interesting. A donkey tends to be what they call self-persistent. 
self-persistent. Now, this is what I didn't know. The, the design of the donkey's ears, a donkey can hear really well. <laughs> and it, it said that the donkey, because of the design of its ears, it can denote its predator coming before the predator even gets there. That's why it's often said that a donkey is preferred. Like if you have, if, if, if you have a herd of sheep and you had to choose between a dog and a donkey to help guard your herd of sheep, the donkey would be the one preferred. Why? Because of its capacity to hear far off. The donkey might not be the strongest one to pull the plow, but he can let you know if something strange is coming. My God. Yes. Okay. I might not need the donkey on the plow, but, if I, but I might need him out in the field. It's about knowing where are to place people in your life to make them the most productive. Come on, I preach. My God, my God. Nothing wrong with either animal, but it's knowing how to utilize them. And making sure they're in the right place at the right time. I ain't got the well, uh, yes, I have gotten the people. I'm going back and forth. I see I learned that in Bible. And, and, and when you when you have a sermon, sometimes you go from the biblical situation to the practical situation. So I'm going back and forth already. <laughs> So there was a reason why he said, don't have the ox and the donkey on the same job. The productivity is not going to be the same. Mm -hmm. Because you have two totally different animals who have a different hero, who have a different build, who are, by nature are differently, and they're, and they're temporal. See, and, and people have categorized the donkey as being stubborn. But you know why the donkey is stubborn? The donkey is stubborn only if it feels that it's being threatened. And now who wouldn't be a little resistant to go in, in a direction if you know that your well-being may be threatened? See, the donkey has gotten a bad rap. The mule has gotten a bad rap. So to be consistent and to improve your productivity, it's best to have. If you're going to have an ox, go ahead and put an ox on the other side. If you're going to have an ox on the left, go ahead and put an ox on the right. If you're going to put a donkey on the right, go ahead and put a donkey on the left. But don't mix them. Lest your productivity goes down and you get frustrated. Some of you are frustrated because you don't have the right hookup Pulling your stuff. What do we say? The wooden frame? The, the yoke, it goes around the what? The head and the what? And the neck. Look at it. And with the ox, the ox is thinking one way and the donkey is what? Thinking another way. It's in the what? Thinking. The reason why you're frustrated with people is because they think differently. Absolutely. But even in thinking differently, there needs to be some commonality to get the job done without a bunch of craziness and foolishness. So, so, so we got that? Y'all got that? Amen. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Let's deal with agriculture. Now let's deal with people. 2 Corinthians 6. 2 Corinthians 6. Verse 14. Y'all got it? Hopefully you do. 2 Corinthians 6, verse 14. Amen. Okay. 
2 Corinthians 6, verse 14, Paul says to the church at Corinth, Be not unequally what? Yo! Now, stop right there. Yoke, when you're dealing with animals, you deal with the what? The head and the what? Neck. Neck. Now, watch this here. Yoke, when you're dealing with people, you're talking about a frame, but you're not talking about a wooden frame. Uh, huh? See, with animals, you're talking about what? A wooden frame. Huh? But when it comes to people, you're not talking about a wooden frame, but you're talking about the Word of God, which does what? Frame the what? The Word, according to Hebrews 11 and 3. You got that? Two different frames. A wooden frame. Versus the word of God, which is what? A frame, isn't it? Right. According to the Hebrews 11, 3. Yeah, it is. Now, watch it. When you're dealing with animals, the wooden frame is put around the what? The head and the what? Neck. Now, when it comes to people, the word of God comes to do what? Deal with the what? Heart and the mind. two scriptures down here. Hebrews 11, 3, Jeremiah 31, 33. Both of which deals with God's word. God's word represents a frame that comes to deal with the what? The heart and mind of the individual. So now, if we understand that, then be not unequally yoked together with who? Unbelievers. Is he being judgmental there? No. But an unbeliever's heart and mind are not in the right place. Huh? And he said, "Be not unequal, be not unequally what yoked. The framework, the frame, the frame, the frame. The unbeliever, the frame is not. They don't have the right frame. When you people have the right frame of mind, you ever want to say that? Yes. Hey, Lord, keep me in my right in give me the right frame of mind." Yes, Lord. Come on, guys. Some people just are crazy. <laughs> Their mind is off. You're not being judgmental. truly 
it can frame our little hearts and minds if we allow him. Because behold, I stand at the door and knock. And if any man open and let him come in, Lord, when you truly allow God to come in to your heart and to your mind and deal with you where you are, then you you're going to leave from the visitation a little different. Yes. If not, then something, you miss something. He says, what fellowship have righteousness with unrighteous and what communion? Huh? Look, look, look. look. Let me show you. First, that word yoke, the word fellowship, the word communion. What does that imply? Commonality. Being on the same page. Huh? Hmm. Some of you, you're looking for commonality. You're looking for fellow. You're looking, you're looking for that common ground. And you can't find it. Why? Because everybody's not on the same page. What communion have what? Light with what? Darkness. All you're dealing with here are what? Opposites. Believer, unbeliever. Righteousness, what? Unrighteousness. Light versus what? Darkness. Mm. Verse 15, what concord? Now, in some translations, it says, what agreement has Christ with Belial? Belial is another name for the devil. What's the get what he had there? Opposites. Huh? Verse 16, and what agreement? Paul must be trying to say something right here. He keeps using these same words over and over again. Agreement, fellowship, communion, yoke. What is he trying to imply? Togetherness. Togetherness. Agreement. But you got to be in the right frame of what? Mind. What agreement have the temple of God with what? Idols? Young people, you need to be, you need to go down this, you need to look at this list here. And you need to be mindful and cognizant of losing your circle. You're not being judgmental, but use discernment. Use wisdom. Are they perpetuating light? Are they perpetuating righteousness? Are they perpetuating Christ-like behavior? Well, if not, because right now you some of you watching, you, you, you join at the heart and mind. I need to revisit that. If the right frame is not there, the right frame being the Word of God. <clears throat> for, I'm still in verse 16. For ye are the temple of the living God, and God hath said, I will dwell in them and what? And walk with them and will be their people, and they should, and I will be their God, and they shall be my people. Well, that sounds very similar to Jeremiah 31, 33, doesn't it? Yeah. Very similar. What's the challenge here? What's the challenge here? You know what the challenge is? Sometimes we are afraid to choose a different approach. Yes, God. We are, a, we are afraid to what? Choose a different approach. We're afraid of what we're going to lose. We're afraid that somebody's not going to like it. Oh, well, who cares? Your life is at stake. Your soul is at stake. Your sanity is at stake.
thing of verse 16, I like verse, uh, well, what I like about verse 16 there, yeah, he said, for what agreement have the temple of God with what? With idols. Now, now uh, you know, right there in that example, you have to, you have to bring to the table Abel. Mm -hmm. You have to bring to the table for verse 16, Abram. Because in verse 16, you got two options. You're going to either choose God or you're going to choose who? Idols. One or the other. One or the other. Huh? Now, now you go back. We talked about idols, didn't we? Yes. Because here's the thing you understand about Abram. Abram came from an environment where idolatry was the call of the day. His father's name was Terah. Terah. Now, you write this scripture down. Write this Joshua. Joshua uh, 24. Two says, And Joshua said unto all the people, Thus says the Lord God of Israel, Your fathers dwelt on the other side of the flood in old time, even Terah, the father of Abram, and the father of, of Nacor, and they what? Served other gods. So Abram came out of a messed up house. Huh? Abram grew up in a house, in an environment that promoted unrighteousness. Huh? But Abram had to do what? Choose a different approach. Huh? Well, what did, what did Abram do? Look, turn to Genesis 12 for me. Genesis 12. Genesis 12. I'll give you a minute to find it. Genesis 12. Genesis 12. Huh? Genesis 12. Now I want you to look down there at verse number 1. Genesis 12, verse 6. What am I saying? We have to learn how to sometimes choose what? A different approach than what is presented to us. We can no longer use as an excuse. Well, I was brought up in a house that did this. I was brought up in an environment that promoted this. I was brought up in an environment that said this was okay. But at some point in time, you have to know God's word for yourself. And you have to choose a different approach. That approach may be different. Look at what it says in Genesis 12 and 1. It says, Now the Lord has said unto Abram, Do what? Get thee out of thy country and from thy kindred and from thy what? Father's house. So whatever was going on in your father's house, Abram, God said what? Get out of there! He said, get out of there! Unto the land that I will what? Show thee. He said, I will make of thee a great nation. I will bless thee. I will make thy name great. I will bless them that bless thee. Verse 3, curse him that curses thee. And in thy name shall all families of the earth be blessed. Verse 4 says what? So Abram, he chose a different approach, didn't he? Yes, he did. He chose to obey God. Hmm? Now, because Abram decided to obey God, all right, go back to Joshua. Go back to Joshua chapter 24. Go back to Joshua chapter 24. Verse number three. It 
says there, verse number three, and I what? Took your father Abraham from the other side of the flood and did what? Led him throughout all the land of Canaan. Why? Because Abram chose what? A different approach. What is Paul simply doing here in 2 Corinthians 6? He's letting these readers know here you have to revisit what you're doing in your life and choose a different approach. Going back to 1 2 Corinthians 6, 17, wherefore, Paul says, come out from among them and do what? In verse 17, separate. he separates. You have to choose a different approach that sometimes will cause you to be different than others, separate from others. But if it causes, but if it's causing you to be unequally yoked, you gotta revisit. 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 You gotta have the right frame. The right frame. The right frame. The right frame being what? The word of God. The word of God, it comes to challenge. It comes to wake us up. It comes to help move us forward if we want to move forward. Yes, sir. And it takes work. It takes work. It takes effort. It takes time. It takes the power of choice. It takes effort. It takes emotional. Uh, it, it, it takes emotional effort <laughs> to accomplish God's will, to accomplish God's purpose for your life. But if you want to achieve that which God has created you to do, you have to be willing sometimes to revisit your approach towards certain areas in your life. Having the right frame, the right frame, the right yoke, the word of God, serves as that frame that comes to impact the heart and the mind of the individual. Hmm. Just like that wooden yoke comes to impact the head and the neck around those animals that are using the agricultural trade, so is God's word used as a frame, as a yoke, to help impact the heart and mind of the individual. So the challenge again comes to what direction do I want my life to go in? And do I need to revisit my approach that I'm going? Do I need to revisit my approach? Do I need to revisit my actions? What am I doing? And sometimes, you know, you, you have to sit down and you have to think about it. You have to revisit. You have to look at it. Look at it. Wrestle with it. Jacob wrestled with what was going on in his life. Sure did. But it's tough. It's tough sometimes. It's tough. But you have to ask yourself more do I want to do better? Do I want to find myself in a better place? Well, then. 
you have to revisit what's framing your life, having the right, having the right frame in your life. Father, we thank you on today for this opportunity to study your word. Lord, I pray even now if there's one that's not saved and tuning in and they want to, you want to give your life to the Lord, I want to pray with you on today. If you don't know who Jesus is as your Lord and personal Savior, you need, the, you need the right framework in your life. If you listen to this word and you say, you know what, I don't have the right framing in my life. I, I need a personal relationship with the Lord Jesus. That's you on today. just want you to pray with me, pray this prayer with me. Dear, dear Lord Jesus, I heard your word on today. I'm a sinner. I know my life is not where it should be. I'm way off base, but I heard your word on today. My heart and mind is not in the right place. But I heard your word on today, and I want the right frame. I've been trusting in so many different things, but on today, I want to put my trust in you, Lord. I believe that you came, and I believe that you died for my sins on the cross. I believe that you were buried, and I believe that God the Father, he raised you from the dead, and that now you're living now and forevermore. And I want you to come into my heart. I receive you now as my Lord and personal Savior. Touch me now, Lord. Touch my heart now, Lord. Touch my mind right now, Jesus. I open myself up to receive you now as my Lord and personal Savior. In Jesus' name, I pray. Amen. If you prayed that prayer with me on today, then I truly believe that you have given your heart to the Lord. Now, you got to invest in that choice. You got to invest in that decision by finding a church home and going in and, and joining and making a commitment to grow. Making a commitment to learn. It's a lifelong journey. It's a lifelong process, but you have to start somewhere. And that starting point for you is today. Don't just sit out on it, but do something with it. Do something with it. For those of you who, who are tuning in, who love the Lord, and you know, you've got some things going on in your life, you've got some areas in your life that aren't quite where they need to be. There's some actions, there's some things going on that are not agreeable. You backslidden, you, you, you've fallen off the cart. Well, get back up. Brush yourself off and, and get back on the on, on, on the right pathway. Pray for you on this morning. Lord, I just pray right now. Father, for the one that's listening and says, I just needed some encouraging words on today. I just needed someone to, to just speak that word to help me get back up and to get going again. Father, we pray for them right now. God, we pray for the one that, 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 that's struggling in that area of their life. God, we pray, God, for wisdom. We pray, God, for, for, for discernment. God, we just ask you to speak through your word, to give them direction, to give them insight into that area in their life that's struggling. And you give them insight into that area of their life that's lacking. God, we know that you're able. We know that you're able to provide. We know that you're able to put the, the right resources in place. Help us to be sensitive. Help us to be sensitive to doors of opportunity. Some doors need to be closed, Lord. Some doors need to be open. Lord, help us to know the difference. Father, we thank you now. And we ask you, Lord, that as, as, as there are those who are, who are getting ready to enter into a, a new dimension of living, a new dimension of functioning for the first time, God, help them, yes, show them. But they got to have the right frame, Lord. They got to have the right blueprint, God. They got to have you to take center stage, first and foremost. Father, we thank you. 
that you've given us your word so that the devil doesn't come and, and completely destroy us and, and take us out, but you've given us your word to stand on it. And we stand today. And as the song says, we dare not trust the sweetest frame, but wholly lean on Jesus' name. On Christ, the solid rock, we stand. All other ground is sinking sand. We thank you for your word, Lord, on today. We give you praise. We give you honor now unto him who is able to keep us from falling and to present us faultless at his coming to him. Be dominion, honor, and glory. Let everyone say amen. 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 God bless you. Look forward to seeing you again on next time. Mm -hmm.